I want you to know that when I did what I did about, oh, that's lame, let's try that again. Good morning, good morning. And we kind of entered in. I did that on purpose because the temptation for all of us is to walk into church and it's like, oh, yeah, here we are again. And to be here, and it's a good thing to be here, but it can feel an awful lot like rote, a lot like duty, which isn't bad, but that's actually setting a pretty low threshold. There is another way to come. And it doesn't mean you have to gear yourself up emotionally. This isn't a, a cheerleader where I have to go, good morning, and you yell back, and the adrenaline gets pumped up. Yeah, we're here. doesn't have to be like that. That actually can be incredibly emotionally manipulative. I instead, it's a sense of expectation. Because you see, what we dare to believe, and it's a dare, is that through the very simple things that we do, often half-hearted, sometimes broken, sometimes we get it wrong, that Jesus actually really does show up. And that he is here, and if he is here, if he is true to what we know of him in the scriptures, that means he wants to do things with us, in us, through us, by us. And if somehow our expectation level is way down here, that church is, in essence, something to get through, uh, to hopefully maybe get something out of the sermon or that something will happen to us in some way or another, but not in terms of genuine availability, then I think we miss out. Now, God has an extraordinary ability to defy our expectations, especially if he really wants to get our attention. A little story. When I was a college student, and I went to try an Episcopal church not too far from where my family attended. And it was a, this was at 8 o'clock in the morning. And there was a big church, but they had a little chapel on the side, and that's where they had their 8 o'clock service. The liturgy was Cramner, which meant, you know, in our parlance, write one, and which is lots of these and thou, Shakespearean English and the like. And I was the youngest person there by at least 30 years, at least. And I'm sitting in the back, so I am obviously a visitor. Everybody else is pretty much about the same age, and which means they sort of look like I do now or older. And, um, and, what, and I didn't expect, I didn't know what was going to happen. I just thought I should go. I went. Well, to my astonishment, and I mean that literally, the words, Cranmer words, thee and thou Elizabethan English words, were just bang, again and again and again. God was using it to pierce my heart. I was shocked. I didn't expect anything like that to happen. And then the biggest shocker of all was when, we, when it came up to receive communion, obviously I'm way in the back, so I'm the last person to receive. And I put out my hands to receive the bread. The priest puts the bread in my hand. I put the bread in my mouth. And I have this experience, it's almost terrifying, of God in my mouth. I, I actually didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I was just profoundly, it was like God said, yeah, right there. And I, I, I didn't know how, how to handle it. I mean, I received the chalice. and. Then I got up, and when I got up, and of course I'm making my way back, I'm literally putting my hand on each of the pews to steady myself. That's, that's how powerful it was. And a part of me, of course, everybody out there were like this. It's just almost motionless. <laughs> and a part of me wanted to go, do you realize what's happening in here? You know? Now, for all I know... There were profound intercessors among that group of people who saw this college student at the back of the room who, was, who could have been their grandson, and they thought, oh, we ought to be praying for him, and did. Maybe all of that was a chain reaction to the prayers by people I have never met and will never meet again until I get to heaven. Then I'll know, but I sure don't know now. But all I know, what I do know is, is that I had no expectation for anything like that to happen at all. 
my expectation was to go through the service. To, and that was, that was pretty much it. But expectations, in fact, actually matter. But God delights in surprising us. And it is the kind of surprise of impossibility being answered that we see in the scriptures this morning. All three lessons. Old Testament lesson, book of 1 Kings, the story of Elijah raising from the dead the son of the widow of Zarephath. Secondly, the Galatian lesson, the story of Paul's conversion that he relates in the book of Galatians. Here I am persecuting the church of God, but what? guess what I'm doing now? I'm actually an apostle of the very faith that I was persecuting, reaching out to Gentiles, goyim, meaning dog, people who should not in any way be a part of the covenant promises of God. It's like, how could that happen? And then a story in the, in the Luke that actually mirrors the Old Testament lesson. And this is the story of Jesus coming in and healing the son of the widow. Every single time, people did not expect, including the recipients, for anything like that to begin to happen. Let's look at a minute at the Luke story. They're heading out of town. Why are they heading out of town? They're heading out of town because you don't bury bodies in town. There's no such thing as a funeral home and getting a body ready. They wrap it up, and the, the body's got to be in the ground within 24 hours. Otherwise, the desert eats desert does bad things. And so they're, they're going to get the body in the ground as quickly as possible. But this woman is known in the community, and they love her. And they're there out of profound sympathy because this is a widow, and this is her only son, meaning she has no visible means of support now that her son is dead. The son's the breadwinner. She has nothing. So what is she going to do? And so they're there actually because they care. And they know that what's in front of her is awful. But there is also that sense among some who were there, because this was so much a part of the Judaism of the time, was that there's a kind of quid pro quo about this. In other words, if something happened to cause this woman's son to die, what, what went on in that household? What, did the widow do something? Or was something going on with the boy? I mean, the thought would have been exactly what the widow in the Old Testament story said to Elijah. Have you come to visit my sins upon me and kill my son? That would have been what some might have assumed. Even though, even though the character of God is not like that. I mean, look at the psalm. The psalm says something very, very different. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous, cares for the stranger, sustains the orphan and widow. In other words, it has always been the character of God to be a God who at the very heart of who he is is mercy. Not you do this wrong and therefore this bad thing happens to you. And so if there's one thing I want you to get out of the sermon today is have to ask, is there within you somehow the sense that we really do live in the kind of universe that, to quote the phrase, what goes around comes around, and if you do bad things, God's going to do bad things to you. Because if that is in fact a part of your understanding of the very nature of God, you will never want to draw close to him. Because there will always be reasons in your heart, if you pay attention to your heart, to show you that you don't qualify for answered prayer, for the grace of God, and for his mercy in your life. And therefore, you will always keep God at a distance. And the whole idea of me coming at the beginning of the service and saying, come on, let's get into this together. It's like, no, because if I get close to the presence of God, something unbelievably terrible might happen to me. I know what I did yesterday or maybe even this morning, especially those of us who wrestle with a kind of secret life. You know, the, there's the public persona, and there's who I really am on the inside. And since we know, as we say every single Sunday, Almighty God to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, from whom no secrets are hid, I'm dead in the water. Right? Nod your head. But if I understand in the depths of my soul that who God is in the very heart of his character 
is that he is a God who gives and acts in mercy, which is exactly what's being said in all of these scriptures this morning. Then I can come. I can be in his presence. And I know that what God will come and bring to me as I step in, as it were, is not what I deserve. But mercy. Mercy. Forgiveness. Kindness. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Because you see, more often than not, the reason we come weary and heavy laden is because life is hard and we beat ourselves up to boot. And we have all this interior fighting on the inside as well as on the outside, and it's a real struggle. And we show up and we're it's good. Man, don't ask me to enter in. I, it's, it's big that I even came at all. Well, if you know that who you're coming to be with is a God who comes and speaks mercy, it's worth it. It's always worth it. It is always worth it. And it doesn't even matter in the end how big the stuff is on the inside with which you wrestle. Because the other thing that's consistently true about all three of these lessons is that God is doing in these stories the impossible. The impossible. Raising dead people to life. Converting a persecutor into a man who knows compassion. Maybe even for the first time in his life. It is out of the box, if you want to use a cliche, don't hem God in to the manageable. And it's not just what happens when you come into church. It has to do with the way you think about your day. I don't know about you, but I'm actually overscheduled most of my life. You know, it's all about what shows up on my calendar on my iPhone. Well, I got this and I've got this and I've got this. But it has also everything to do with what, how I step into the day. Because sure, all that's lined up. It's my job. It's what I do. It's okay. But if all I'm doing is just trying to get through my routine, that means, again, my expectation level is way down here. I just want to get through it, do the best I can with what I have. But if I know that somehow God is in this and that he wants to do things, regardless of how I feel, whether I slept well last night or not or no matter what's going on in my brain, that's a very, very different way to think about your day and to think about the people that you meet in your day. Just Friday night, Laurelie and I had dinner with Charlie and Brooke at a restaurant over in Altamont. And uh, we got there early and so because the traffic was kind to us getting from South Orlando up into Altamont. And so we got there early and I checked on the reservation and it was there and we sat down and we were waiting. But as I sat down, I noticed the host who was there had this huge boot on his left foot. And I said, how did that happen? He said, oh, I broke my foot doing racquetball. I slammed my foot into the side of the wall as I was going for a shot and my foot just did this. And I, that, yeah, that's what I did. I winced. I said, oh, oh, that really hurt. And I said, mm. so I sat down. And then, not long after that, Charlie and Book arrived, and we were on time, and I turned to him, and I said, listen, I really hope your foot gets better. In fact, I'm going to pray for your foot. Let me tell you, the, his, his whole face changed. His response was, oh, I am so grateful. Now, to look at the guy, you wouldn't know. I mean, he didn't have any tags on him that said, I'm open to prayer. <laughs> You know, he was just the host at a bar restaurant, you know? It has everything to do with your availability, in other words. If, if you live around a life of managed and low expectations, you will go through your day and you'll get things done and you'll be efficient and proficient and things will happen. But why would you want to live such a boring life as that? It does, you see, to be available for God to use you is to have an expanded vision of God. It means, number one, yeah, I am, in fact, the object of God's mercy. And if I didn't believe that, I could never step out into that because otherwise there'd be a part of me going, who are you to get out there? It's not like you don't have your own struggles. I mean, there is a kind of demonic 
in my view, condemning voice that wants you to live at the level of low expectation, to see, be somebody who basically fits in, doesn't stir up trouble, manages your day, and does your best to try to be the best fill in the blank, husband, employee, dad, student that you can be. But why? But if you know that you are the object of God's mercy, and the one who has had mercy on you can do the impossible, well, that changes everything. Then all kinds of things can begin to happen, both in you and through you. And so that's why I go back to, what's your picture of God? Do you see God as one who, in fact, wants to give you mercy? Not just the person who deserves it, but you. That he wants to give you mercy. I, I saw this just yesterday. I was up at St. George, our church up in the villages. And what was happening over the course of that weekend was a ser seminar called the Welcome Home Initiative, led by a guy named Nigel Mumford. Nigel Mumford is orig was originally a British subject, now American citizen, lives in New, New where? Virginia Beach, sorry. And Nigel was in the British Marine Corps. Nig Nigel saw serious horror in combat. PTSD. And through a whole series of circumstances, God began to do great healing in Nigel's life about the tremendous horrors that he had participated in and seen as a soldier in combat. And he knew the stats. You can look this up online. 22 vets commit suicide because of PTSD every day in the United States of America. 22. And so it's like, we've got to do something about this. So he basically started this ministry called the Welcome Home Initiative. And I was privileged, and I mean it, to be a part of the closing ceremony of that three-day event that happened. Vets had come in from all over the country, and uh, to hear them in that service uh, tell their stories about what they had been and what God had done, it, it was just astonishing. It was an honor, in fact, to listen and to be a part of what was happening. I mean. The wounds of Jesus touching the deepest wounds in the lives of these men in a way that was changing them on the inside. Only Jesus, you see, can do that. And if they had all believed that they had to qualify, they'd say, oh, my record says no way. You don't know what I've done, Jesus. Well, he says, yes, I do. Come anyway. And they began to be the recipients. For some, it was transforming. For some, it was gradual. For some, it was just the beginning of a whole new journey. But the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus was breaking into their lives in a way that they never thought possible. And I can even say to you this morning, no matter what the trauma, if you have been in it and it's in here, there is a way that light and love and healing can come into your life in a way that reduces the fear, brings a greater sense of calm and hope, and gives you a level of purpose that begins to rob you of the curse of living an in-between life, which is the inside of you and the outside of you, and trying to manage that all the time. Anybody who knows trauma gets that. Jesus can begin to break that yoke. So what's the message for today? The message is, what do you believe about God? Do you believe that he wants to impart mercy to you? And do you believe that because he is the God who breaks into the impossible, that no matter where you've been or what you've done or what's going on in your life right now, he can take you by the hand and begin to bring life, real life, in a way that you never thought possible, but certainly is. That's the message. That is the message. So that what can begin to happen is that you live a life not managing routine, 
but being a part of the adventure of what God can and will do, both in you and through you. So come on, be a part of that. Ask God to reshape how you think about Him. Ask God to open your heart to new things that He wants to do in you. That some more of the life and the joy and the adventure can, in fact, be yours, not just somebody else's, yours. Let us pray together.